then you have a Pilar family back. So thank you. And Becky Kelly here. So good to have you guys. In fact, why don't we just welcome everybody? Take a moment to stand up, shake somebody's hand, tell me you're so thankful that they're here. I know I'm thankful that my friend Jan is here today. The friend. I get to start job. I wasn't planning it in the video. It works. It's different. Kids who are here to love the I don't know how it exactly do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do this what? Yeah. I don't know why guys want to do it. Do you have any up going yet? Technology, how well have you guys been doing smoking? Oh. I challenge you guys all to start smoking last time I was here. In fact, I told you from the Bible, from the prophecy that we saw, that if you're not smoking, you're going to get smoked. How many of you guys want to be smoked? Where the smoke is your torment, it sends up forever and ever. It's like the prayers that find no resting place. But we saw in the book of Revelation that every Christian would smoke, it says, in the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. That's Revelation chapter 8 and verse 4. And so we looked at that. We're going through prophetic Sabbath morning evangelism. And as we're looking at that symbolism, we're seeing that, one, smoking is addictive, right? Now, we don't want to smoke the world smokes and the devil smokes, but we definitely want to come in contact with the God who is always smoking. How do I know God is always smoking? Because he's a consuming fire. That is right. And who's he praying for? He's praying for us. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, we know Jesus is praying because he told us there in John before he died on the cross, he spent that time of prayer, and he said that I'm praying for you. And not just for you, for the disciples, but also for those who would come after him. And he prayed for unity. And so we challenged you to start smoking together. Because there's, you know, a little bit of uh, camaraderie, right? When you smoke together, a social event. So I challenged you, and I showed you how to start smoking corporately. And uh, I got some news that maybe you guys aren't addicted yet. <laughs> that maybe when I wasn't here, it didn't happen. And so I just want to challenge you, and, and I want to give you something before we leave. I'm going to give you guys some, some ways to get smoking more regularly before you go. So at the end of our message today, you're going to get some uh, material that will go in your Bible, and hopefully it will help remind you to smoke every day so when you come to church, You'll smoke all together. Got it? All right. So Jesus is teaching us to observe how many things? All things that he has done what? That he has commanded. It's on the screen. And lo, I am with you how often? Always, even to the end of the ages. Remember, Jesus is always with his people. Sabbath morning evangelism. Reach up for life. In our opening psalm, opening scripture was Psalm chapter 5, and she read verse 3, but I'm going to start in verse 1. The word of God reads, give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. You know that God cares about what you think about. You know, when somebody is really listening, they give you their ear. They're not just ready to speak, but they're ready to listen. And here God is being represented as one who is ready to listen. He knows the struggles that you have. He knows what you're going through. He knows the, the decisions that you have to make. And he says, I am listening. Verse 2. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I will pray. 
his pain. He's paying attention. He cares about what you care about. He cares about the struggles that you're going through. And that's why in verse 3, our response is, My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning, I will direct it to you, and I will look up. And so I have something for you to do every single morning. What do we do in the morning usually? Now, not everybody does that, but follow along. What do we normally do before we get our day going? We read the Bible, right? So what I've done by... And I have to give credit where credit's are due. I guess I'd have to say my wife largely is going to do, but I told her what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're going to get the benefit of my wife's labors, but we made some bookmarks. And the reason why I made them as a bookmark is because I figured if I just gave you something to, to write some things down and remember to pray about, you probably would end up throwing it away or end up somewhere in your house. But I figure if you could use it as a bookmark in your Bible that you probably are reading every day, I'm hoping you get to read every day, then it will remind you to look up in prayer to your God. So just know you're going to get that. Can life be like this at times? Where you feel like you're just going around in an endless cycle. You're really not going anywhere. You see all sorts of commotion, you hear all sorts of noise, but you just seem to keep going round and round. Anybody ever relate to that? Yeah? That's how I feel as a parent at times. That's how I feel as a pastor at times. It feels like you're just on a little treadmill going round and round going around. It's kind of like this dog. Well, he at once had a label that said where he was going, but he got a little hungry. And you can see he ate a portion of the label, and now you can see in his eyes, he's pretty, pretty much in despair. He doesn't know where he's going, and no one else knows where he's going. Is that how it can feel at times for us as a Christian? Like we're missing the label. Where are we going? What do you think are some things that can cause us to lose track of where we're going? And you put the screen. Electronics. I will now to save some perfect friends. Is that what they are? That's right. We all use them. We all need them at times, I guess. I don't know if you really need them, but uh, I feel that way. <laughs> but can they become a distraction as well? Could we end up getting so focused on the latest news feed that we forget about God's news feed? We are more concerned about someone's recent post than we are about posting something to God who can actually make a difference and change something in the lives of ourselves or us. I think that's possible. How about can we forget about the millions of people who are starving, who are literally dying in our world? You know, if you look at the amount of money it costs for our military. And you know, I know that there's a recent push to increase our military and all that, but they've actually done the numbers that if we were to take the money we spend on our military, we could feed and clothe the entire world. It would just a little bit too good to worry about those people that we should be praying for. How about national disasters? They seem to be increasing, don't they? Doesn't it seem like every time we turn around, there's either a disaster that's breaking out, a flood like that took place in Houston. There's all sorts of things. There's kids that are starving. There's a world that is falling apart. Racism is not God. Racism is alive and well and seems to be gaining ground. Yet, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that there is supposed to be an everlasting gospel that goes to every nation, every tongue, every people, every kindred, that has no bearing on whether we're rich or whether we're poor, but a good news that is supposed to be proclaimed with a loud voice from God's people, but maybe we're getting a little bit distracted or forgetting to pray for the things that matter. There's wars and there's rumors of wars. There's bombings and explosions. We just read 
recently um, sent some bombs out, didn't we? Kind of like this little boy. Any of your kids ever get afraid at night? I know my boys can get afraid at night at times. They won't listen to you. Probably talk real tough, but some of them need night lights. But we can feel that way as a Christian, can't we? As we look at the world around us, we get a little overwhelmed, a little scared. As we see all the pain, all the suffering, all the hurt that's taking place, we get a little bit cold maybe and just brush it off. Do we know where we're going? Do we know what we're doing? Do we know why we're here? Well, Jesus has the answer. In fact, what I love about the Bible is that there's always hope. In the midst of a world that is falling apart, we have Jesus, and he's telling us these words. He says, I am the what? I am the what? You guys have to come half dead. Are you here? I am the way. That's right. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And so Jesus is telling us that there is a better way. There is a real solid truth. And there is life. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you come from. Jesus has a way for you. It doesn't matter how lost you are. Jesus can direct you home. And that, my friend, is the truth. And the truth will give you life. The Bible says that no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. How do we get to Jesus? Where is Jesus right now? You got all the answers. Were you reading my notes? I bet you you were reading my notes. You got into my Bible and you started reading it, didn't you? That's right. You're a smart cookie. You must have a good mom. John 1 verse 4 says, In him, speaking of Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men. How is that light shining in your life? Do you see more clearly? Are you aware of what's going on? Jesus told us that we need to know about the signs of his coming, did he not? That these things would be taking place, that there would be famines, there would be pestilence, there would be earthquakes, there would be Donald Trumps, there would be Hillary Clintons. I mean, isn't that essentially what he was saying, that there would be complete chaos? Thank you. You're a good listener. I like you. You could be like little children all the day. That's right. Joshua and Caleb, right? We could be a good team. Jesus is there every single day. He sees what we're going through. He sees us as we go around, like that opening picture where you seem to be going in circles. He watches us as we interact in our families, in our homes. He watches us as we interact in church. And he's there, and he's, he's just waiting to do something for us. And, and what a lot of people don't realize is they struggle with prayer. They struggle with prayer because they think, well, doesn't God already know the answer? Doesn't God already know? know how to answer my prayer or what I'm thinking. Doesn't he, is this just a religious exercise that we do to make ourselves feel better? What do you think? What is prayer for? Doesn't God know everything? Is this a relationship? Why do you think he's praying? I mean, doesn't God, isn't he to do what's best anyway? I mean, doesn't he care about the person you're praying for? I mean, these are real questions that real people ask. And I want to tell you that Jesus has real answers. Amen. And prayer is not something we do to make ourselves feel better. In fact, we have a privilege at Seventh-day Adventist of having a complete viewpoint, a behind-the-scenes picture that helps us to understand exactly what's going on. In fact, it's called the Great Controversy, and that's why I'm so glad of our children's story. Like, Ten bucks, come on, I was expecting a hundred or a thousand in there. I mean, that book is incredible. 
but the point was clear. We see that there's a war going on. Now, how many of you guys like cheating? How many of you guys like to play a game and someone, you know, you just, you're playing with cheater? How many like that? Not you? I don't like cheaters either. Man, I hate playing games with cheaters. Why? Why do you hate playing with cheaters? They cheat. That's right, they cheat you. It's not fair. Well, you know what Jesus doesn't do? He says he is the truth. He doesn't cheat. Right? So there are rules in this battle. Now, as Adventists, you guys should know, who's the battle between? God and the devil, right? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. We see that Michael and his angels were at war with Satan and his angels, right? So there's this cosmic battle that's taking place, and God plays by the rules. Right? So what are the rules? Jesus said, knock, and the door will be open. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find, right? And so I want you to think of it this way. God has set the rules. He says, look, I don't want to force non-believers to love me, but I also can't force believers to love me. I can't force anyone, but I'm going to lay out the rules. I'm going to give them the key, and the key is very simple, my friend. It's called getting on your knees, or maybe sitting in your car, or standing up as you walk, and you pray to God, and when you pray to Him, it unlocks the ability for God to do what He already wanted to do, but He can't violate anyone's conscience, He can't violate anyone's will, and so the devil is trying to keep us from praying, because as soon as you pray, you release God. And that's why Jesus said, my house shall be a house of prayer. Because a church without prayer is a church without hope. A church without prayer is a church without power. Yeah. My friends, prayer is not something we do to feel better. Prayer is something we do so that the world will be better. Because Jesus plays fair. So you give him permission to ask. You give him permission to get involved in your children's lives. You give him the permission to get involved in the community's life. You give him permission to get involved in your life. You see, Jesus there in Revelation is standing at the door and he's knocking. He has all power. I mean, if Samson could bring down, you know, the gate and pick it up and put it on his hands, and, and Samson was, was small in comparison to the Almighty God, why is he standing at the door and knocking? Why doesn't he just rip the hinges off and come in? Because he's trying to teach us a very important lesson. He knocks, but you can only let him in. Prayer is you letting him in. God wants to get to know you. You know, there's many that will say in the last day, Lord, Lord, we went to church. We paid our tithes. We even helped with different projects and went on mission trips. And God's going to say, I don't know who you are. You did it all without praying. You did it all in your own works. I have no clue who you are. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. My friends, how well do you think you get to know someone that you don't talk to? Because some of you just talk and you don't listen. There's two sides to this equation, and that's why I'm trying to teach you guys how to smoke properly. You need to talk to God, and you need to listen to God. This is how he knows you and you know him. It's a relationship. So you're right. There's a relationship. We'll have to further ahead than I am. So what is Jesus saying? So that it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the time of the end. They were eating, they were drinking, they were giving marriage. All these things sound pretty good. In fact, have you ever thought about this from a spiritual viewpoint? I mean, sometimes we think about it and we say, oh, they were eating and drinking, so they were probably drinking alcohol, and they were eating bad foods, and, and they were getting married, so all these things. And, and, and all those things are true to a degree. You can look at the antediluvian world and say that, but the part that if you read the great controversy that really hits me are the ones 
that you would have looked at and you would have thought that they weren't altogether evil. They weren't altogether worshippers of idols. They seemed to be followers of God, and yet they didn't get into the ark. Why not? Have you ever thought of it as that they were eating communion bread? They were drinking communion bread. They were standing before the altars and the churches and having Christian marriages, but they didn't get into the ark. You know, I think Jesus is more concerned about that. About a group that are deceived. A group that is, are not friends. In the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. They were doing all these things until the flood came. And it was over. My friends, the days is coming when this is all going to be over. God's not going to just allow this world to continue to destroy itself. At some point, he's coming, and he's going to put an end to this. Amen? Amen. But do you want to be known, or do you want to be like those who did not know? You may know all the signs. I mean, the Jews knew all the signs of the coming of the Messiah, but they missed the Messiah. Why? Why did they miss the Messiah? It's very simple. It's the same reason why Joshua got tricked by the men of Gideon. Got tricked. He thought he could handle He thought he knew all the answers. That, that, that he knew what was going to happen. And, you know, there's some people I talk to, and they say, oh, yes, when, when the National Sunday Law comes out, I'm going to really get my life together with Christ. No, you're not. You're not going to. If you're not going to get together now, you're not going to get together then. You're not going to get together now. It was in the days of Noah. How important are the words of God for you? You know, please, don't look at this as, God has got some sort of magical potion for you. And if you spend time in the Bible and you spend time in prayer, that all of a sudden everything's better. And if you don't, God just wants to condemn you. It's not what this is about. What this is about is that you have in your hand a book that may not have a lot of pictures in it, like the children's story says, that may seem old and outdated, but I can guarantee you, because I've personally experienced it, when you open up the pages and you allow the words to go into your heart and into your mind, they actually meet my current needs right here in this current time in my life. Amen. They are the words of life. They are true, and he will show you the world. You see, don't look at it as something that you have to do to earn God's favor. It's God's favor that he's given you a map. And he says, look, just follow me. Just follow me. But we got some serious issues at hand. If you guys have ever heard of the population explosion. I mean, just... The world has just been exploding in population, and they claim that if you give it another 20 or 30 years, that we're going to be like standing room only at the rate that we're going. I mean, we went from, you know, so many uh, uh, billions or millions or whatever billions, and I mean, we've just been multiplying rapidly within just the 20th century. It's crazy. They're saying that, now if you think about it right now, if all the people that are here right now, we can't feed them. What happens if war comes? Do you think starvation can start occurring here in the United States? Man, I sure hope we're praying for people that it's happening to now because I hope we're doing more than just praying and trying to help them. <coughs> what about if it happens here? Do you guys know that right now we have less um, we have less uh, Variations of seed that we've ever had before. 
Companies like Monsanto and other companies like that have been buying out the seeds and they've been modifying them. And slowly we've been losing all the variations. And they're doing it for the purpose, they're trying to spare, they're trying to do it so that they, they keep us from losing our crops. But the variations help because if one variation was to get hit with some sort of bug or, or whatever, then another variation would, would still survive. What happens if man's best works fall short? We don't got any other variations to fall back on. Does starvation occur in the United States? Do we have a shortage? Do you know that they had the same problem in the days of Noah? Now this blew my mind, but actual people who have, have uh, studied the the, the lineage and the, the begets and all that have actually calculated based on the environment, the, the conduciveness of the environment, the, the longevity of life, and they did the models. They said actually that in the days of Noah, they had fully populated the earth. Probably didn't think about that, did you? They were actually great reaching overpopulation in Noah's day. Wow, that's a lot of people that are lost. There was probably some food shortages. I just, can you imagine that? Lining up with your little pan, your belly, hasn't had a good meal. You're hungry. This is, this is real people's lives outside the United States. This, is, this really occurs. Hoping to get a little drop of bread, something to eat. Pictures horrifying, isn't it? How about a social crisis? Do you think we're having social crisis right now? You don't think so? Well, we are, son. You're just not old enough to know what I'm about to talk about. But it's coming. The sons of God, they saw the daughters of men. But they were beautiful. Mm -mm -mm. Good looking girls. You know what it said? This was an issue in the days of Noah, is that the sons of God, that, and what that's referencing is the children of Seth, the, the lineage that was supposed to be following God, they got tied up in the world because the girls of the world seemed more fun. They seemed more attractive. They allured them. And what started to take place is the godly people started mixing with those who didn't want a relationship with God, and what was created is before us today. A lukewarm church. And you know that that's exactly what it was in the days of Noah. A lukewarm, prayerless church. They took wives for themselves of all that they chose. What's the issue that we have today? Divorce rates are going out like crazy. Broken homes. I come from a broken home. I mean, when I try to explain to people my dad, I gotta try to explain first which dad I'm talking about. Satan wants to break our homes apart. Are we praying? Are we praying for our marriages? Or are we just doing whatever we think would make us happy? How about this one? What time is it? Sex o'clock. No matter what time you look, it's sex o'clock. And we live in an environment that is just saying sex, 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 sex. Isn't it? Every billboard, everything that we see, every movie. Now, is there anything wrong with sex? I sure hope not. But are we falling to the same issue? That we're doing whatever we want, we're taking whatever we want. And we're living our lives the way we want. We're not taking time to pray. Porn industry is going out of control. I mean, you can't, you can't escape it. It's everywhere. It's popping up all over the place. I mean, it's the no, it's it's actually overtaking cigarettes and all the other things. Porn is the biggest industry. It's a little hook to take us away from praying. Right? Coming to God 
for him to meet our needs. But as the days of Noah were, do you think they struggled with corn in the days of Noah? I'd say so. Broken homes in the days of Noah, overpopulation in the days of Noah, lukewarm church in the days of Noah, wars in the days of Noah. Yeah, just read your Bible. Read what the, the prophet um, had to say. What was it? Enoch, the prophet. You can read that in the book of Jude. Read what he said about the condition of the days of Noah. It's strikingly similar to our day. Matthew 24, 37 says, So also the coming of the Son of Man may be. Great wickedness. Is there great wickedness in our day? Go on. I'm getting tired. You should come up here. You want lots more energy. It says in Genesis 6, verse 5, And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was what? It was great in the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil what? You think about that. In the days of Noah, every thought, every intent of the heart was only evil? Lord have mercy. They didn't even have the cell phones. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have the same things that we have. And yet, the issue was an issue of the heart just like it is today. I want to challenge you that it's not an issue of how well you are at re reserving yourself from these things and from focusing on the Bible. It's not about that. It's about the heart. Have you gotten to know your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Do you love this moment? Yeah. And there's so many school shootings. It's horrible atrocities happening right here in the United States. Every single day I, I see something else that just baffles my mind as I think of this. But was that not what was happening in the days of Noah? They died as fingers crossed. Isn't that how our politics are? Do you think it was like that in the days of Noah? Yeah, it was. Um, it was just like that. People getting up and promising great things, but not fulfilling their promise. Judgment is blind. Doesn't it seem that way in some cases? And I just read about someone who came up and uh, sucker punched a guy, didn't know him at all, just walked up to him and punched him. He was a father of five. He died in his clock, fell down, hit the floor, hit it just right, he died there. The young man that punched him, I mean, just was doing it for fun. That's the days in which we live. He was just doing it for fun. He ran off with his friend. They finally captured him. They sentenced him to 10 years. And he paroled in two. Justice blind. What's on our TV? As the days of Noah were, so also the coming of the Son of Man be. The wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What about our hearts? I hope they're good. The Bible doesn't have such good news about our hearts. The Bible says that our heart is desperately wicked. But it is deceitful above all things, and who can know it? Are we just like it was in the days of Noah? How about corruption and pollution? As I was driving here on my way, I saw some people picking up the sides of the road. Praise God for that, right? But we are corrupting and polluting our earth. Did they do that in the days of Noah? The earth also was corrupt before God. Genesis 6 11. And the earth was filled with what? Violence in the days of Noah. Revelation 11 18 tells us that God is going to destroy those who destroy the earth. Did you know that? Should we be concerned about the earth? Protecting it? Yes. 
It is our whole planet that is in danger of deterioration. Surely mankind has reached a turning point in history. He must do something now to reverse the deteriorating environmental trend, or else our children and our grandchildren will find the earth quite uninhabitable, and it will be even uh, it will even be increasingly more unpleasant and unhealthy for us. These are world leaders saying statements like this. You know that the world is scared based on what's happening. I heard him talk about Stephen Hawking. He's scared. In fact, you know when you hear what Stephen Hawking said, he said something that reminded me about the exact same thing that was said, being said the days after the flood when they built the Tower of Babel. Why did they build it? So that all the earth couldn't be destroyed again. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. We are simply living in the very last day. What do you think we should be doing? We should be praying like we've never prayed before. We should have our smoke ascending up into the heavens. Not the smoke of pollution that we see. I mean, there are places. When I go to the Philippines, I'm wearing my Philippine um, shirt here. I really like it. They gave it to me as a gift. I have to wear it from time to time. Well, when you're there in the Philippines, there's people having to wear masks. The pollution is so bad. There's some places like um, in China and different places like that where they actually warn you not to exercise outside for long periods of time. And it's hazardous to your health. But there's also places like that here in the United States where the pollution is so bad that you can hardly breathe. They have all sorts of disasters and spills, oil spills. Are we destroying our earth? Yes. But as the days of Noah were, so also the coming of the Son of Man be. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. How can you think? Where is the good news? Where is the hope? The hope comes when our thoughts is united with the thoughts of God, and that only happens through prayer. How about violence and crime? Are we seeing violence and crime increase in our day? Yeah, the earth was filled with violence. Our schools aren't safe. Our churches aren't safe. People are living in fear. It's only death. Did you know that suicide is actually one of the leading, it's actually the leading cause of death now in the world? It used to be homicide was, you know, when we're talking about murder, not like, you know, heart disease and things like that. But suicide has actually passed homicide. And homicide has increased. Do you see the problem? Gang violence. Man, the gangs today aren't even like the gangs when I went to school. It's so much different. Everything's increasing. But as the days of Noah were, so also the coming of the Son of Man being every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continue. What about materialism, secularism? And just plain out revelry. Is that a problem? Was it a problem in the days of Noah? And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given marriage. They just had a good old time. Until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came, and destroyed them. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man revealed. How do we bring fire and brimstone on someone's head? We can. For Jesus says, when we do acts of kindness, we actually put Hold the fire on their head. Right? How do you do to do acts of kindness? How are you going to have good thoughts if every thought and intent of your heart is constantly evil? You've got to direct yourself to him who can guide you in the way, the truth, and give you a new life. Don't be like Lot's wife. Her heart was in the city. She couldn't do without her electronics, or she couldn't do without her whatever it was. And she was lost. 
The only thing that we can't do is have prayer. Amen. We find it God. Amen. What do we want to see in you? We may not be distracted by the partying. We may not be distracted by the social media, but maybe we're distracted in service. Maybe we're distracted in the morning when we get up. And we think that we have so much that we have to get done that we just don't have time to break the words of life. We don't have time to pray. We don't have time because we got to get all this stuff done. So that, And if we get it all done, we'll take time to pray and we never find that time. Right? I mean, there's people that are addicted to real smoking. They don't know anything about the real, real good stuff. But I want to give you the good stuff. It'll make you high and light. Oh man, it'll lift you up when you're feeling down. It'll give you energy when you've got no energy. It'll help you when you see no remedy for your health. And that is prayer with God. But as the day to know were, so also the coming of the Son of Man be. How about a warning message? How long did Noah preach? 120 years, right? How many people got in the ark? Man. Three? Add five to one, so you do right. <laughs> and the Lord said, My spirit shall not. The Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man for what? Forever. Forever. You know, there's a day that's coming when God's spirit is going to be withdrawn from the earth. There's a lot of people that think that we're crazy and Adventists for teaching that. They, they say that's impossible. How can God's spirit be withdrawn from the 